Hello! Hi! And welcome back to our blind read-through of Saya no Uta, the song of Saya. So, I'm pretty sure it's obvious by the way we cut from the last episode that my sex scene alert level had reached critical status, uh, indicating imminent naughty content was on the way. But I think I was still able to kind of cut that episode at what I felt was a, a pretty good spot um, that I think left a lot to the imagination. Uh, like, you know what's coming next, but I, I didn't show it. And I still think that that can be really affecting. And if you don't need a lot left to the imagination, because this is a Let's Play where I told you I'm going to be up front and forward with a lot of the naughty bits that's here. We're not going to dance around them. Um, the, 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 the sex scene was very intense it was very depraved it was it, it, it is exactly what you like if you imagine in your head what was just about to happen you'd probably be very very close it was just straight up like yeah that's why we're here i guess um but yes it was a it was a a sex scene between fuminori saya and a completely brain broken yo and well, I do think sex in most of the ends is, is super, superfluous. Um, I felt that this scene in particular was incredibly effective at going uh, <laughs> head first, uh, if you will, um, into uh, the depravity that Fuminori has, has, has surrendered himself to. And that's, that's ultimately the game, right? That's ultimately what this story is. It's, it's giving in to depravity both, I think, for Fuminori and the reader in a way is just like giving into that surrendering your surrendering yourself to it and 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 just being the monster and 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 that can be titillating in a lot of different ways it's 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 taboo for some and super uncomfortable for others and I get it but it's supposed to be and and I'm actually enjoying this game's exploration of that and 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 i think that it's been pretty smart about this stuff so far so yeah so that that little preamble out of the way i just kind of wanted to touch on that because i i know that like during my uh, visual novel playthroughs i've always been pretty much like ah sex scenes are bad they're boring most of the time but this one actually felt like it helped accentuate what this story is going for in a way that I don't think you could have danced around it. Like, this is what was going to happen. This is what was planned. And we just got to roll with it. So, let us get back into things. Put on our serious face. Get the video game to, to, to be active. There we go. It ha I, I clicked it and it actually just went active the first time. That's wild. That never happens. Uh, so, we will jump right over Chaw and get things started. Later, as I lie on my bed, completely drained of energy, I consider what my life will be like from now on. <laughs> A lot more threesomes in your future would be my guess. Saya is resting in my arms. Yo is curled up on the floor. Yesterday, I could not have imagined that the three of us would be a family. <laughs> a new home, new food, a new family, all granted to me by Saya. She has selflessly led me from the brink of death to find new joy amid despair. And I, too, have changed. <laughs> Just a bit! Just a tiny little bit! I have killed two people with my own hands and made a third my mindless slave. Well, you didn't really do that one. Let's not... Look, you did... You've done some bad things, but you are not the one that did this. Yet despite all that I have done, I am still able to sleep peacefully. Without a doubt, I am no longer the Sakisaki Fuminori I once was. How far will Saya take me? What will I become, my sweetest friend? I feel somewhat unsure, though not discouraged, about the unknown world in which, into which we are heading. And so, while playing with Saya's hair, I ask, I don't expect an answer. If Saya is asleep or doesn't, need to, or doesn't want to respond, I won't mind. 
Saya lifts her head, however, and draws my gaze into the deep pools of her eyes. She thinks for a while, searching for the right words, and says simply, ふるさとから遠く遠く離れてもしかしたら草木なんか一本も生えてない砂漠に落ちちゃうかもしれないそんな時たった一粒のその種が何を思うかそれを想像してくれればわかってもらえるかもしれない Okay, so you were like an aberration, like you kind of ended up, like you are not supposed to be here. Like, I mean, I guess that just goes without saying, but I get like from the metaphor she's using here. As I consider Saya's answer, she continues her story. Could have a whole bunch of little Saya's running around, sticking brain meats in people and, and brain tubes. Be great. Do your best, little seed. Come! It's come! Sora. Saya smiles softly and caresses my cheek. Oh, you know, just love. Maybe that's all. So does she mean that she could maybe be like a normal girl and not just like, you know, <laughs> a gross collection of tentacles and meat? I don't know that that's a I don't know that that's a possibility. The loving touch of her slender fingers fills me with peace and joy. I pull her into my chest, nodding silently. This isn't even a threat because she know what well, like we know that she would let us leave from the asylum ending, so this isn't even a threat. Uh, and I don't think Fuminori is at all interested in, 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 in leaving. Not at all, friend. Basking in the soft warmth of our love for each other, we sink into ob the oblivion of sleep. I almost said, well, 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 look where we find ourselves. That wouldn't be funny at all, especially since I've already said, well, 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 at least once. I'm pretty sure anyway. He has been buried alive. His world is the silence and cold of the grave. Ever since his voice gave out and he lost strength to scream, no coherent thought has passed through Koji's mind. Perhaps this is his brain's way of protecting him from despair. Instead, he dreams. Images flash before his eyes, random, unconnected scenes from his 20 years of life. Not all are happy times, there are sad, painful memories as well. But even these are pleasantly warm compared to the death that is now encroaching upon him. He dreams of mountains. His older brother once took him hunting for insects when he was a child. They sealed their caught butterflies in a plastic bag, only to later find themselves holding a bag of dead butterflies. He dreams of his lover. They met at a mixer where he'd been the only, other, the only one to realize that she couldn't hold her liquor. After she'd had too much to drink, he looked after her for a while and uh, she vomited in the back alley. They toasted each other with canned juice and then... He dreams that he's drifting into a dark sea. When he reaches the bottom, he looks up at the moon, shining through the surface of the water. As he gazes up at the circle of light, entranced by its roundness and brilliance, the distant rumbling of an engine reaches his ears. Yeah, this is what I thought. He got the call out. 
he got a call out to Dr. Tombo, so uh, I'm pretty sure she's like going to rescue him. I didn't say anything about it because I didn't want to spoil the suspense, but I kind of, I figured this guy wasn't done for. Something still conscious within him tells him that this dream is wrong. Have I ever gone diving at night before? The dots begin to connect in his mind, forming a barrier separate from his dreams. What is bothering him? Of course, the sound. The engine noise gradually fades to a low idling and abruptly makes way to silence. It gives way to silence, followed by the sound of the door opening and closing. This isn't a dream. These sounds are real. Understanding comes like a sudden blow. This isn't the bottom of the sea, and the circle of light isn't the moon. It's the mouth of the well. The sun has already risen, and someone is right outside with a car. The last, the last piece falls into place, <clears throat> and he becomes Tono Koji once more. Help! Koji shouts, surprised by how easily his voice emerges. His desperation blocks out the pain of his raw throat. Down here in a well! Help! He keeps screaming with all his might. Soon, the echoes of the cramped well become deafening, and he is no longer certain of his screams, or have, of, that his, scream, of his screams have meaning, or if he's just howling wordlessly. Nevertheless, he continues. His only desire is to be heard, lest he die forgotten at the bottom of this well. Koji's wait is too, Koji's wait is not long, but even a minute feels like eternity when you're bang, when you're when you're hanging by your fingertips on the edge of despair. Soon, the circle of light above him is partially eclipsed by the silhouette of a person staring down into the well. Yep. It's a woman's voice. Koji has heard it somewhere before, but for some reason cannot remember to whom it belongs. The silhouette vanishes, restoring the light to a perfect circle. Fear of being left alone again threatens to send Koji into a panic, but his reason is recovered enough to resist. She said she's going to get me out. I haven't been abandoned. While waiting, he gingerly tests his body, which he had forgotten all about until now. His joints ache and his fingers and toes are numb, but though, uh, uh, but though exhausted, he's still in one piece. After some time, the silhouette reappears at the top of the well. Koji lacks the confidence to attempt such a feat. His frozen fingers can barely move. You make sure to tie that shit off real good up top. The last thing we need is the two of us down here. Though, I mean, I'd be okay probably being caught in a well with Dr. Tombo. Like, I, I, I think, you know, if that's the way I had to spend time with her, I think I could make it work. After a brief pause, the owner of the voice tosses a knotted climbing rope down the well. He grabs the rope as soon as it reaches him. The tough threads bite into his palm and the relief nearly overwhelms him at the sensation. This is really happening. He's really safe. I hope so, anyway. Like, I still think Dr. Tombo is, like, probably doing some bad shit. And I don't know that Koji is completely out of the woods. I don't know. Like, while I do think he may get out of this well, I don't know. Maybe she'll just fucking stab him down here and finish the fucking job. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, who knows? Maybe let's 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 try having a little faith in the good doctor, shall we? Now that he's free from despair, questions leap to the forefront of his mind. First among them, who is this savior? The rope shakes as the woman climbs carefully down, the beam from the floodlight slung over her shoulder, pushing back the shadow cast by her body. Soon, she is standing in the same mode as Koji, and he finds himself face to face with... Sensei? Like, who else would it be? Koji could not have imagined that his savior would turn out to be Dr. Tombo Ryoko, neurosurgeon at the T University Medical Center. Of course, it took him a moment to recognize her. Instead of the white gown and tight skirt, she's wearing a heavy leather coat, denim jeans, and boots with no heel. She must have expected a hike through the mountains. 
Her light is a blocky all-purpose type featuring side-mounted fluorescent runners, in addition to the main floodlight, survival gear, and professional grade by the look of it. You look awful, Dr. Tombo says wryly as she gives Koji a once-over. Here, drink this. She pulls a flask out of her pocket and hands it to him. She walks around with a flask? Maybe Koji's just old-fashioned, but it doesn't seem appropriate for a young woman and a doctor at that. Nah, it's fine! Like, if you'd have told me that when we first saw this girl on screen that she had a flask, I'd be like, yeah, that, that fucking tracks. Nevertheless, he, he unscrews the cap and takes a swig and struggles to keep from coughing at the potent liquid sears his tongue. No. What does she drink? What's she drinking on? Spiritus vodka. Yes! I knew it! I knew she was a vodka girl! Just like myself! I knew it! I knew it! I knew this girl was good. Spiritus vodka. Good for disinfecting wounds at a pinch and also does a fine job of setting things on fire. Her tone is straightforward and quite serious. Koji can only gape at the doctor, the dark smile on her face doing little to ease his confusion. Is this really Dr. Tombo? There's no trace of the bookish, mild-mannered woman Koji met at the hospital. She in no way seemed bookish or mild-mannered. How could you look at that woman and those legs? Whew! At all and think, oh, she's bookish and mild mannered. There's nothing about this. This woman has been an entire energy from the moment she entered my screen. Her expression is now set on a hard mask and her eyes are sharp and wary. In the darkness at the bottom of a well, it is possible, however unlikely, that the change in her features is due to the ominous shadows cast by the lamp. It's not so easy, however, to explain the change in her demeanor. You called me, didn't you? Ryoko replies brusquely, glaring at Koji like an annoyed professor. Uh, yep, tried calling back, but she didn't answer, neither did your friend Tsukuba. Am I supposed to think everything's fine? I mean, you gave her an address, like she had every means of getting here. Koji still doesn't understand why she acted so quickly, but it's a different part. But it's a different part of what she just said that seizes his attention. Well, look at you. It's like it's good news day for Doctor, because guess what? No corpses, technically. That's right, he almost died, and at the hands of a man he thought was his best friend. Anger and frustration well up inside him. He can't forgive Fuminori's betrayal, nor can he forgive himself for his foolishness. And now he has no idea if Tsukuba is safe. Fuminori tried to kill Koji. Could he have done the same to her? <laughs> Calm down, why don't you? Ryoko says irritably, turning away to examine the inside of the well. There's nothing you can do from here. If you thought that there was something was wrong, if you thought something was wrong, Koji says to her back, then you could have called the police, right? You believe you? Yeah, she's like ACAB all the way, baby. Still engrossed in her examination of the walls, Ryoko laughs scornfully at the idea. You think a cop is gonna do anything to make any situation better? Oh, you naive little sunflower. Annoyed by her condescending attitude, Koji's about to demand answers when she cuts him off with a gesture and shines a light at the corner of the well. Huh? In the light of the lamp, Koji sees that some of the stones are a different shade than the rest of the wall. This must be what Ryoko was looking for. Huh? Are they, are they like climbing stones to get out? 
Ryoko's gaze moves slowly along the wall, fall, uh, finally coming to a rest on the gap between the two stones. The hole is just wide enough for an adult to reach in. Oh, oh is this like a... Did you just accidentally get shoved into and rescued inside of a, a secret a secret room, a secret hallway, an underground fucking like superhero lab and lair and labyrinth and shit? Kimi. You sure picked the right well to fall down, Ryoko says with a grim smile. Like they say, it's always the last place you look. She wastes no time thrusting her hands into the opening. After she feels around for a few seconds, Koji hears the thunk of something solid coming together behind the wall. Ryoko pulls her hand out and gives the different colored stones a gentle push. With the number of weights shifting, the stones slide smoothly back into the wall. Oh, you've been here. Koji wants answers, but Ryoko ignores him and peers into the opening. In the beam of her floodlight, Koji can see a concrete tunnel leading into the mountain. I'm going on ahead, Tono. You'd better stay here. Her warning is simple and utterly devoid of warmth. Considering his options, Koji looks from the tunnel to the rope and back again. He's practically sweating now thanks to the 190 proof vodka he just drank. <laughs> but although the feeling has returned to his fingers, he still doesn't have the strength to climb. That said, the thought of being alone in a well again makes him shiver. <laughs> Ryoko steps into the tunnel without looking back, and Koji doesn't hesitate to follow. You were pretty different the last time we met, Koji says sarcastically following Ryoko as she moves cautiously down the tunnel with her light leading the way. Touche? Don't be that type! Koji, Jesus Christ! A woman doesn't have to smile! Stop it! Ryoko suddenly stops and stares at the floor where Koji looks uh, 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 when Koji looks over his shoulder he sees a dust covered rope lying coiled up in the middle of the path. Oh. Ryoko picks up the rope, examines it, and hands it to Koji. この両端が繋がって輪になってたのさ。え外のどこかにこの輪を引っ掛けて井戸の底まで伝っておりえ、いや。Yeah, yeah. Ryoko shines her light down the tunnel, revealing that it ends in a closed wooden door about 10 meters ahead. I just thought y'all were actually, like, behind him disappearing. I didn't think that Ogai, like, disappeared, like, on his own. I thought he was disappeared for some shit that was going on at the hospital. That's what I thought. Yeah, you and Sakisaka aren't the only ones, Ryoko replies dryly. I checked Ogai's cabin a while back. Oh! Tombo got a gun! Okay! Let's go! Fucking little snub nosed piece of shit, too. God damn! Also, yeah, she's got it. She got it and she knows it. This woman could beat my ass, and I love it. I just, I love it! As Ryoko speaks, she opens her coat and pulls out what she had hanging underneath it. We're just gonna have to, oh yeah, okay. Oh, jeez. 
At first, Koji thinks that she's holding a steel pipe. Amazed that she would be carrying a weapon, Koji looks closer and is appalled when he realizes what it really is. A gun. And not one of those sleek handguns that he's seen in the movies, but a double-barreled shotgun. The stock and barrels have been sawed down for easier concealment, enhancing its aura and of brutal efficiency. Yeah! Yeah, she's about to go fucking doom on somebody's ass. But I don't think dude's alive down here is the thing. <laughs> 12 gauge shotgun, Ryoko replies bluntly. Uh, blandly, as though uh, naming a brand of cigarettes. <laughs> I don't have a permit, and cutting it down would be illegal even if I did. Any other questions? Protect you? Dude, you literally just got thrown down the well. Do you not think right now that, like, with the situation that you are in, that this seems dangerous as fuck, and that maybe you want somebody there that's got a fucking super shotgun from Doom 2? You might need this. Don't sweat the details too much, my guy. Ryoko looks over her shoulder and gives Koji her most chilling smile yet. God, she's so cool! Look at her, she's so cool! God, she's awesome! Okay, so when you learned of what Dr. Ogai was doing... Okay. The woman whom Koji believed was just a normal doctor waves her sawed-off shotgun menacingly as she continues, her tone sharp and bitter. Koji listens in silence, helpless to do anything but watch and under- uh, oh, to wa- but- holy shit. Koji listens in silence, helpless to do anything but watch as understanding moves farther and farther from his grasp. だから、これから私がやることは一切合切。君とその友達が足を突っ込んでる泥沼のありさまを終わらせてやるための手続きだ。その辺をよく理解して、余計な口は突っ込まないこと。いいね。God, look at her. She's so cool. Koji can only nod weakly in response. With the light in her left hand and the shotgun in her right, Ryoko walks up to the door and takes a deep breath. Then she kicks the door open, putting her full weight behind the blow. There's nobody in here. There is nobody in here. With a disappointingly feeble sound, the door breaks off its hinges and falls into the room. Dust billows like white smoke from the beam of Ryoko's light. The room is large, at least 35 meters square. The tiled floor is set with drainage grates, and there's no mistaking that, an that there's no mistaking the operating table sitting in the middle of the room. Cabinets full of enamelware and drugs line the side of the of the space, and against the opposite wall stands a writing desk and bookshelves. Even Koji can recognize that much. The mysterious objects cluttering the tables and shelves, however, are beyond his comprehension. Mirrors delicately engraved with complex patterns, grotesque statues, and masks that must have been left by a race of savages, tapestries woven in nauseating arrays of colors, a crystal ball the size of an infant's head. Any would fetch a hefty price at the antique store if not for the one thing that they all have in common. Every last piece is so loathsome and foul that Koji feels sick just looking at it. It's as though each was designed for the sole sinister purpose of immortalizing its creator's hatred of the world. Rare-looking books of the sort that he found in Ogai's home are piled here and there. And on one shelf are stacked some scrolls that look like they were made from some kind of sheepskin or papyrus. Whatever it is, it's not paper. Finally, there are the indecipherable chalk patterns and symbols filling every available space on the walls. Even the two sliding blackboards are covered in strange, unreadable scribblings. Just looking at them is making Koji dizzy. Look, don't look, Ryoko snaps at him. 
絶対に何かに触ったりするな。Yeah, that's definitely seems like the best advice. In a place like this, I don't even want to look. I don't want to touch nothing. I literally kind of just would rather get out of here like, and leave. <laughs> like, that's probably the better idea. Ryoko switches her lights' fluorescent runners on and sets it on a nearby table where it can illuminate the whole room. She then holsters her shotgun, only to pull it out even more confusingly. A more confusing set of tools, a digital camera, and a can of spray paint. She gives the can in her left hand a good shake, switches the camera in her right hand on, and steps up to the blackboard while looking at the camera's side mounted screen. After recording one set of symbols, she covers it with, black, with a thick layer of paint, then moves on to the next. <laughs> Not she mentions it, Koji realizes that she's only looking at the screen of her camera, even then, only in short glimpses and never directly at any of the drawings. He understands what she's saying, but it still doesn't make any sense. I'm imagining that, like, actually reading whatever she's covering up, like, just reading it would make you go fucking mad. Koji begins to fear that this doctor might be even crazier than Fuminori. Despite the burst of energy he received from the vodka, Koji is still exhausted from his night in the well. The fear is affecting his body, making him dizzy and nauseous. Soon, the walls are covered in black paint, and the stale air is thick with the smell of turpentine. That should do for now, Ryoko says with relief, then tosses the empty can aside and puts away her video camera. What happened to Ogai? Koji asks, supporting himself against a nearby table. Oh, he's dead. Without stopping her examination of the papers on the writing table, Ryoko points nonchalantly at the, to a Chinese style screen standing in one corner of the room. He was there. Her clinical choice of tense makes her meaning instantly obvious. The urge to see for himself is irresistible. Koji staggers across the room to the screen, taking the utmost care not to look at the scaly octopus thing that's painted on it. Behind the screen is a large easy chair. Although he's never met the man before, Koji is fairly certain that the person sitting in it is Ogai Masahiko. Hi! You are... That, oh, that weight loss program is uh, really working out for you, dude. Just looking absolutely great. Shed so many pounds. A guy's corpse must have shrunk significantly while drying in the sealed chamber. The body is barely the size of a child, with only the business suit hanging from the bones, offering any hint of Ogai's former statue. His empty eye sockets are wide open, jaw are filled with darkness, the same darkness that surrounded Koji at the bottom of the well. Compared to those gaping voids, the tiny hole in Ogai's right temple is almost demure. The revolver that he presumably used to kill himself is still clenched in his dangling right hand. It looks like a child's toy compared to Ryoko's shotgun. Ryoko must have noticed Ogai's corpse while, he was while, she was while she was spray painting the walls, and still she kept working without batting an eyelash. Impressive, though not exactly surprising after what he's been through. It's getting difficult to remember the last time he spoke to someone sane. <laughs> but if not for her, Koji reminds himself with a, bitter, uh, with a bitter smirk, he would have ended up joining this mummified corpse here, and no one would have ever found him. Koji's vision suddenly dims. He's, pu he's pushed himself too hard, and the spirit is vodka can't, no, and the spirit is vodka can't help him anymore. He collapses to the floor, unable to hang on to his slipping consciousness, and the last thing he sees are Ogai Masahiro, Masahiko's gaping eye sockets staring at him.
That feels like a good a place as any to call it a day. So we'll go ahead, drop our savey save. Right, y'all. So, yeah, I kind of figured that our, our boy Koji wasn't done for simply because, you know, he had gotten the call out. He had gotten the address, you know, so, so Tombo knew where he was going to be. I didn't expect her to come in and be cool ass full on commando, but now I'm totally here for it. Um, and, and now we know like what's happened to a guy. We don't know why. I imagine going forward, we're going to be like, I, I feel like we're in go mode. I feel like. All right, all the story in this, all the, all the secrets of this story are gonna start kind of spilling out now. You know, Saya's kind of given us a little bit to go on about what her true nature is. We we know a guy is dead, and I'm pretty sure we are going to find out why very soon uh, and what he's been up to. Very exciting stuff. So thanks for stopping by, and I hope you have a nice rest of your whatever, and we'll catch you next time. Bye.